This week, the Security Weekly crew interviews Micah Hoffman. Security news this week will include John McAfee for president and a whole bunch more. So stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild. Packets aren't the only things getting sniffed. Systems aren't the only things getting penetrated. Functions are the only things getting wrapped. Bits aren't the only things getting banged. And the cocktails, they flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. This segment is sponsored by the most trusted source for computer security training, Whoa. certification, and research. Visit SANS.org to explore the full curriculum and latest training offerings. Hmm. Looking for a career change? Tenable Network Security is hiring everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all of the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash tenable jobs. Pony Express. Check out their line of penetration testing devices, including the Pone Pad, the Pone Phone, and the Pone Pro. For enterprises, there's Pone Pulse, providing continuous visibility into wired, Wi Fi, and Bluetooth spectrums across all physical locations, including remote sites and branch offices. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at ponyexpress.com. Onapsys, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsys.com. Hey! Welcome to Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. This is episode 434 for September 10th. 2015, and it's the official start of football season, and if you're here in New England, you probably root for this team. If you're anywhere else in in, uh, the United States or the world, you probably hate the Patriots and me right now, and um, I don't care. So, (laughs) a couple of quick and Oh, let me introduce everyone first who is here. Jack is here in studio. Look at this. I am? What? Hey. hey, What are you drinking? Is that straight Jameson? I have no idea. No, it's whatever you're drinking. It's a different color uh, from what I'm drinking. Well, it's because I kind of just... You're, you're uh, old if you and were to look this, right now, Jack. If you were to look this up in a cocktail book, it would, have the, it would be titled The Mistake. Yeah. <laughs> That's every cocktail I make. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I was trying to get creative with your neighbor, and it's really hard to get creative with your neighbor. So yes. uh, there's some good cocktails for it, but I can't I remember like to get off the top of creative with my neighbor sometimes. Get creative with y- 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 your neighbor. God, or God, Jennifer, on, as Americans would call it, but having been, Jennifer. Introduced, it's as, Jennifer. Have, ha- having been introduced to it over there where it comes from. Yes. Um, so I don't know. I'm, yeah, I'm, drinking, I'm drinking booze. It's booze. As, as my friend Mike Richardson from Frankie's uh, told me years ago, the great thing about experimenting with booze is even if it doesn't taste good, it's still booze. Mm-hmm. This is true. Speaking of booze, booze. we get a bunch of people on Skype. I said booze, not boobs. I said booze. The master of the segue <laughs> at <laughs> work. <laughs> you like that, huh? Is Paul already drunk? <laughs> no, I'm not. Yeah, it seems like he got an early start I'm today. just excited. So <laughs> starting from left to right on our Brady Bunch, Mr. Carlos Perez is here with us from Puerto Rico. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. From North Carolina... Joining us on the lines via Skype, Mr. Joff Thayer. G'day, Paul. I'm North Carolina. Carolinian. Carolinian. Through and through. Yeah. How are you? You sound it, Joff. You sound it. I do, don't I? From the Black Hills of South Dakota, Mr. John Strand is here. Uh, is, it, is that your like South Dakota like growl? Is that how you yeah, ex- that's me. I'm mad about I'm mad about my connection. It seems to be getting all kinds of wonky, but it seems straight now. But I'm happy to be here, everybody. Excellent, Mr. Michael Santarcangelo is here with us from South oh, Carolina. You, you got it right. I did. Um, I got oof. the state right. I got your name right. Yeah. I told you. I'm all on right, it's point. That's a wrap, everybody. Have a good day. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's graduating. <laughs> <laughs> that confirms his strong. 
I'm not drunk yet. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. That may be our problem. <laughs> I've got a couple of quick announcements. Time is kick off eight thirty. You can, uh, yeah, that's when I'm I'm out. <laughs> Actually, I have to do the Stogie Geek show, so I TiVo the game, but uh, I, I'm, I'm probably going to know the outcome before I get a chance to watch it. So, which if they win, it's hopefully. It's, I like to watch it if they win. If they don't win, it's, I don't like to go back and watch it because it just makes me an angry Patriots fan. Because we're just... Because yeah. <laughs> there's a shortage of those. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, isn't, isn't that like by definition? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> so make sure you go Damn to it, shop... Damn caught again. <laughs> shop.securityweekly.com. Get your Hack Naked t-shirts. For a limited time only, use the discount code Hack Naked Summer. And get 50% off your order. That's right, 50% off when you use the discount code Hack Naked Summer. It's a summer blowout sale and it ends on September 23rd, 2015, which is the first official day of fall. Tenable is looking for a technical director, work from home position in the US. Check out the link in the show notes. It's not what you think. It's more of like an evangelist style position that we talked about last week, Jack. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it is um, technical skills, the ability to talk to people, the some ability to conference talk to speaking, conference travel, conference speaking, yeah. a bit of travel, the ability to create content in a variety of forms, right? Yeah. So it's you know some writing skills would be necessary, presenting skills right. would be necessary, the ability to um, translate. I mean, it's, there's several of us in the company that have roles that sort of do this. Mm-hmm. You know, you've done it. I do some of it. Marcus does some space. But this is a, a dedicated position, and, and a lot of it really is well, that. Well, because the three of us, we're, we're doing different things right, now. Understanding yeah. what it is that we do right. at a technical level, but being able to translate that into the bigger picture and not just about, it's not about entirely about selling product, but it's mm-hmm. about, you know, it's, it's what, like you said, all of us do in, in bits and pieces as, right. as we're all headed in different directions. And, um, you know, there... I do want to point out one thing. For the right candidates, it is your classic job description. You do not have to have a CISSP. You do not have to have a bachelor's degree. You do not have to have 12 years of experience with Windows 10 or whatever else it says there. <laughs> well, um, 12 I, years with Windows 10. <laughs> you know, no, I just, but, but there are some <laughs> classic you know, HR sort of language in Mm -hmm. that as far as requirements. And there's stuff they'd like. But if you have relevant skills and experience, don't get hung out on every bullet point on that listing. I want to make that clear that the right person probably will not have all of those bullet points, but will have other things that make them uh, more valuable than filling in the checklist. Does it have, like, if you're a 12 on the BSO meter, you're hired? No, it's not a no. sales job. No, again. it's not a sales job. Oh, it sounds a little bit like a sales job. Sorry. Speaking of After that nice sales. setup, you just yeah. ruined it. I know. Just, so hold on. Oh. I got one more announcement. Um, uh, save the date. October 16th, 2015 will be Security Weekly's 10-year anniversary show. Everyone is welcome. Come here to the studio, securityweekly.com forward slash attend. Forty, a few people said they, they are, they're coming here. We're going to have a party. There's going to be food. There's going to be drink. We're going to pour beer in some laptops, and we're going to have a good time. And all of the proceeds will go to EFF. We'll encourage people to donate for that entire day to I, the EFF. I'm bringing my burner laptop that day. Yes. Yeah. And we're yes. Yes, pour you beer are, Josh. In, in burn- I, I'm <laughs> Just I've got as opposed laptops, to your okay? as opposed to your drinker laptop. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the seen. crappy thing is about whenever he he completely drowned his laptop last time is I had just bought a notebook computer uh, just for tax reasons, just kind of burning through some cash. And he's like, ah, I poured beer in my laptop, and I went out and bought a new one. I'm like, oh god, I just bought one. So we're prepping this time. So we're, you guys like light all you guys like light all your show. you light all your cigars with hundred dollar bills and stuff, right? You just have cash to burn. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> Can you buy me an <laughs> a new laptop just to have sure. cash to burn? I wish I had cash to burn. I Carrie's use a lighter to light my cigars. You taught them that. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm bringing, I I'm learned bringing, it from you. <laughs> I learned it from I'm, you. I'm bringing like a six year old Asus. Uh, aspire like three hundred dollars student laptop. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna do. Okay. 
<laughs> we, we have a challenge then. Who can find and bring to the 10th anniversary show the most decrepit, terrifying notebook computer? So the challenge is on. All right. Let's bring do it. it. And we're going to pour Oh, wait, wait. That in. means I, I've got to show up in this. Hey, hey John, I've got to show up then. And we, um, we need some cheap beer. To, yeah. We don't want to put expensive beer in it. We, Chop, some, we need to get some Chop, like. I, Paps Blue I, I'm showing up, so it's not even an option for you, Jot. So, yeah, you have to come. There, there's, oh, no, okay. there's no way. Around. So, myself and Mr. Strand in the studio. Special time. It's going to be special, all right. Uh, speaking of special. Michael Hoffman is here with us, been working in information technology field since 1998, supporting federal government, commercial, and internal customers in their searches to discover and quantify information security weaknesses. He leverages uh, years of experience in real-world penetration testing incident response and holds certifications uh, from SANS, including uh, the GPEN certification, as well as CSI, CISSP even, and is a SANS certified instructor. He's also active in the Nova Hackers community, writes Recon NG modules, and enjoys tackling issues with Python which is much better than Ruby. When not working or teaching, uh, Mike can be found hiking and backpacking on the Appalachian Trail or in many trailer parks, I mean trails, in Maryland. Dude. Catch, him, oh. <laughs> catch him on Twitter Damn. at, at WebBreacher. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. I, I was just kidding. You don't spend time in trailer parks. Oh, I mean, if you do, if that's your thing, that's totally fine. Like, not that you're judging me or anything. Not, I, I'm not. I'm not one to judge. I'm not one to judge. Nice. So, if the minute, sign on I, the Appalachian I, Trail says "Family I, Campground," just steer away. <laughs> so, I got a question. I got a question though about the whole, uh, you know, the white trash thing. So, there's a lot of like where I live, we have a lot of people in RV parks with like million dollar RVs. So, when people roll into those campgrounds, is that like white trash cosplay, or what, is, does that qualify? Ah. <laughs> uh. Wah, 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 wah. Um, so, <laughs> so, Michael, how did you get you started in information security? Hey, glad you asked, Paul. Um, so I, I actually have a kind of a, a warped – this is my third career. Um, I started out with a degree in psychology and uh, decided I didn't like that and then tried to become a doctor – didn't get in, and uh, then I dropped back to the, something that I would have been tinkered. I'd always been tinkering with, and that was, you know, PCs and stuff. Um, worked my way up doing help desk, Mac, PC, Windows Server, Linux, sysadmin stuff. And then at, there was a certain time in my career where I had a choice between going like the programming route or going into security. And I always, uh, always liked the security part, so uh, I uh, I started going that way and. I never look back. I love it. Cool. Um, so how did you come to fall in love with web application security? So web applications, it's actually kind of neat because a while ago, I mean, you know, I was, I've been around since the dawn of the internet. And, you know, web pages used to be so simple. They used to be just, you know, just HTML. You have to write them by hand. Um, but they've gotten a lot more complicated over the years. And I love the compl and complexity. I love all the modules that plug in. To them, I love all, discovering all the functionality and features, and I love that I can do it just from a web browser. I don't need a whole bunch of tools. Um, I was listening to one of your other shows, and you talked about you know the the Firefox plugins that somebody uh, might be using. There's a ton of these modules that are out there that really augment the normal tools that we use every day to do our business. So um, it's just a an interesting puzzle to me. <coughs> Mike, how how do you see – this is kind of a like an in-depth question just because it's one of the things that I've been thinking about lately. But how is the move to cloud-based technologies and software as a service, how is that changing the web application landscape? I feel like uh, it, we're going to see this transition from people writing and maintaining their own web apps to just using someone else's. So how is that changing things in web application security? It's actually kind of neat because if you think about it, there have always been companies and people that have outsourced their web work uh, or they're actually their application design to other companies and outsourced the hosting as well. Um, what we're seeing now is just it's a much, much easier to do with all of these software as a service systems, IAI. IAS, how do you pronounce IAS? The infrastructure is, is that IAS? I, IAS? I think IAS, it's IAS. 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 Yeah. IAS. That's the IAS. 
So, I mean, we've all, uh, there always have been people that have outsourced things. Um, the software as a service is really just an extension of my, my systems up to the internet and somebody else maintains the code and maintains the system. So, um, the downside to that is that many times when people use cloud-based systems, uh, use software as a service, they don't feel like they have ownership to perform security testing on the application. Mm. Um, and they're, they're really sometimes unclear about who owns that data, even though it might be their customers putting it in there, it might be um, their customers that are using it, and they're using it internally for something else. Um, the, those kind of questions, if they're not hammered out before you sign up for that software as a service, um, can really get you into trouble because you might not feel you have a right to, to test the systems to find out if they are secure or not. I also feel like it's going to be a long time before people don't have their own applications. And I think most of the applications that people are maintaining at least have some kind of web component. What's your feeling about how long it's going to take before... We make that full push to putting you know, everything in the cloud. I feel like financials, for example, are going to have their own applications because they want to own everything. And even if they wanted to make that move, it's going to be years and years and years before they're able to do that. Well, there are actually applications out there that, that are SaaS implementations of tax software for corporations, for uh, everything, anything that you can think of, accounting, finance. Um, a lot of small, medium-sized businesses outsource that stuff. Um, yeah, I feel like on the small, medium-sized business, yeah. it's going to happen a lot quicker because they can move and be a little more agile. But if you've got a company that's been in business for 50 years and they've got all the software, it's a long time for them to move, right? It is, and a lot of times those companies have their own internal developers that have been developing on this cold fusion system for, oh, for many God. years. Or Lotus Notes. I oh, mean, God, I yeah. used to be a Lotus oh, Notes God. developer. I know, I know. Oh. So... So, I mean, they have these legacy systems, and, and I think one of the barriers is not necessarily the ease at which things are out in the cloud, but the cost of transitioning all that legacy data that might be in Lotus Notes or might be in an old system, how to get that up to a place where somebody else uh, maintains it. Right, um, right. And there's also the scare factor, too, right? I mean, all your financial data in the cloud, what does that even mean? Yeah, I still think today we have got a, a still an issue of trust when it comes to cloud and, and SaaS applications, for sure. Definitely. So, and Micah? Of the, oh, go ahead, John. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I was going to say, kind of riffing on the idea of cloud and SaaS applications, do you see some type of collision with SaaS vendors kind of starting to take the Oracle approach about security researchers and finding vulnerabilities in their products? Uh, you know what? A lot of them have been doing that. I know. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to call them out here, uh, but but there are several systems that that my teams have tested in the past that just do a tremendous job. In fact, the the hack they have uh, several of them have hackathons where they hack their own stuff and provide their their developers the tools, the opportunity, and even the motivation with uh, financial incentive to take some time off on this weekend to come in after work or you know come in and and hack their own stuff. So. I think the the challenge there is even if I tell you that I hack my own stuff and I've certified it, are you going to believe that? Are you going to trust me? And that trust is really what's what one of the big barriers is to moving to the cloud. Yeah, I I I feel like bug bounty programs have been pretty successful and I think are continuing to morph and become more successful for organizations, uh, especially ones that have these big applications in the cloud. Oh, definitely. I mean, we've seen uh, recently uh, the Bug Crowd team, they, Jay Cran, and and uh, even um, well, some other big hitters in the in the industry uh, using bug bounty uh, bug bounties to not only make money, make names for themselves, but also to help out the community and to do some really good work. Um, a lot of uh, getting back to the small to medium sized businesses. Uh, if you go to Bug Crowd, you can see a lot of the the sites that are in there aren't necessarily the Pinterests and the Googles, mm -hmm. but but there are the smaller companies that maybe can't pay fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for a full blown pen test, but it'll pay three hundred dollars for you to find cross site scripting. Right, right. You know, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, why are the? It seems to me that still, from what I hear and from what I've observed, uh, the mobile applications that are using an API to the web application seems to be the low-hanging fruit, where a lot of these bugs are hiding. Why is that the case? Well, actually, we were just pen testing an application earlier this week, and we found something very, very similar to that. Is that 
in the older, or several years ago, we used to have objects like Fla uh, Shockwave Flash, um, Java applications, and all of these kind of front ends with the nice GUIs and, and the, the pretty whiz-bang widgets in there that also would just communicate to APIs in the background. Um, and it's that, that facade, I guess, that, hey, you, somebody would have to go through our application mm. to get to that back end without realizing that I can take that off, use Burp, use Zap, or something like that, and hit those APIs. So part of it's security awareness, and part of it is a false sense of security in that front-end system. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. Um, what? So what kind of tools, so you mentioned Burp and Zap, what kind of tools are good at looking at, you know, these JSON and REST APIs that are exist in all of these web applications? Well, a lot of the vulnerability scanners are <clears throat> kind of in a crawl, walk, run methodology. Uh, whenever I'm doing a web app pen test, I'm always looking at things through Burp Suite or looking through Zap. And, oh, excuse me. Um, a lot of uh, those tools in and of themselves really have gotten much better at being an all-in-one. So both Zap and Burp have passive scanners that will say, hey, there's some stuff here. They'll tag the MIME types as, as JSON or XML, which will mm -hmm. flag it for the researcher. And then you have all the automated tools, everything from Nessus and Security Center to Acunetics, NetSparker, and, and the dedicated application uh, testing tools. All of those will, will find and and tag them, but what I really find is that it's up to the pen tester, the, the security researcher, to be able to understand what that really is. Because if you find slash API and you don't understand how to submit the post or you don't understand what it's asking for, you'll miss something. <coughs> yeah, it takes the, a human to go read the API documentation and develop some kind of fuzzing logic or custom code, I think, to fully test these uh, APIs within these web applications. Many times you can do, uh, I mean, there are a lot of web application or web services or SOAP um, uh, fuzzers out there. You can also, I mean, instead of developing your own things in Python or Ruby, um, you can actually use Burp and Zap and use their, force, and your, use their, uh, their fuzzing techniques. Um, they're very advanced. Yeah, I've seen, I read, we covered an article a long time ago about extensions to Burp to do, <coughs> excuse me, just that for these APIs. Yeah, and that's the other thing that they're doing. So not only is Burp Suite and Zap doing a, a tremendous job at increasing their functionalities, but they allow the, uh, the community to write modules for them. Um, and some of those modules are just spectacular, extending the, the active scanning techniques or, or allowing different types of encoding or decoding or viewing data in different ways. So, <coughs> so Mike, when you teach the SANS web app pen testing class, do you find it's mostly developers that are taking it? Or is it security professionals that, that want to gain a little more knowledge about web apps, or like what's the split there? It really depends on the area. I taught a class out in um, in California recently, and we didn't have any pen testers in the in the group. It was all developers because in that region where I was teaching, it was it, it was a very big software development area. Um, but in this area here in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, I, I get a lot of everything from CISSPs. Mm -hmm. uh, I get I get managers that are you know that maybe manage a team of of system testers, um, and they want to know more about it to people that have been doing pen testing for their entire lives and maybe are <coughs> just migrating into the web. I find that there's, um, <clears throat> I think, much in the way of, similar to like IoT and firmware-based stuff, that even still today that the overall skill level of security professionals who are charged with defending an organization, the skill level and awareness of web applications, I still think is pretty low. I think we've... Most people understand cross-site scripting and SQL injection, but there's so much more to it, and there's so many different attack vectors that are new that are still coming out to this day. I still feel like there's a skills gap there. Would you, would you say that's pretty accurate? Oh, absolutely. And with the, uh, I mean, you mentioned the IoT. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's web applications, web front ends on everything from configuring your, your thermostat to, I mean, refrigerators and toasters. Everything has a web interface, and yet... They're not all the same, you know. It's not all Apache front right, end right. with a Tomcat back end or and some MySQL there. They are different, and it's those triggers that in the 542 class. That's what I try to get across to the students. It's not just, hey, this is cross-site scripting and SQL injection, but 
when you're doing an assessment um, and you see this type of data, like you brought up, the JSON or XML, you might think, hey, can I access this, this area directly? Because there is no authentication that I, that's being um, managed. So um, I try to give those triggers. And there's a, I'm teaching a 542 in November at Hackfest DC. Um, I'm sorry, in Alexandria, Virginia. And um, in that class, we're, we're definitely going to go over it. The course has evolved uh, very uh, very much since well, that's it's good words. Um, the, the course, <laughs> the course has evolved a lot in the last year, and uh, it's just great to teach and and to meet the students. <clears throat> no, that's that's really cool. Um, so, what are some of the newer attacks uh, that you've added into the course? Well, I I'm the core one of the course instructors. Um, Seth Meisner and Eric Conrad are the, uh, the authors of the course. Um, and they've done uh, some things, everything from including Heartbleed and Shellshock to um, adding some other things that are, are more nuanced. Uh, the course itself uh, has evolved and become a lot more hands-on. Uh, they have a very successful new course, uh, SEC 511, uh, which is, is, is a really... Um, it's a really well-developed course, and so they're rolling that stuff, uh, some of those same techniques, enhanced labs into the 542 class. What, what, other than taking the class, what advice do you have for folks who are in charge of security for an organization? They don't have a lot of hands-on experience testing web apps, and I feel like I want to get these people up to speed a lot more on web applications because... You know, I've, I've had some projects where I've had to use a lot of different web app testing tools. Some make it super easy. Other ones, if you haven't done a manual penetration test, you're going to be pretty lost when you configure them, right? So, yeah. like, what, what, can we, what can we do to, to, to get people to uh, get up to speed? I mean, it's just a matter of doing a manual pen, doing some manual pen test on some test apps. Well, and practice is, is definitely a part of it, Paul. The, the other part of it is understanding what the tools are. I mean, if you look at Kali Linux right now or you look at any of the other pen test distributions, there's so many tools nowadays that you can get really bogged down in, in, in them individually. Um, what we generally teach is to follow a methodology. In the course, we teach a methodology. But if you can't take the course for one reason or another, um, the OWASP testing guide <coughs> on OWASP.org is a really good, very detailed uh, testing guide. Step by step, here's how to test for this. Here's how to test for this uh, with screenshots and, and actual exploitation. Um, that's good. The PTES, P-T-E-S, mm -hmm. is also another good uh, guide to, to go by. And then there's also everything from capture the flags like at DerbyCon or ShmooCon to online, online uh, websites that you can go to to things like Mutiliday and um, damn vulnerable web apps that you can download on VMs. <clears throat> um, did the rest of the... Cast and crew have questions for Micah, uh, web application related? Joff, John, you guys do a lot of web app testing. What are your, uh, what are your favorites, uh, what are your favorite third party burp plugins? My favorite ones? Good question, John. I actually, on webbreacher.com, my website, um, I've, I actually had that same question by another, uh, another person. So I made my list of, I, I don't know if it's a top 10 list, but I made a list of, of them. <laughs> and I usually have two different types of plugins. I have those that I use when I'm surfing uh, the web as myself trying to just use the web as an internet user. And so there's like things like ad blocker and ghostery and, and, and those types of things. And then when I'm web pen testing, um, I use a different set. And all of the ones that I recommend are up there along with links on the website. Um, but it's things, I mean, just to get into it, it's, it's things like Foxy Proxy, which allows me to quickly shift between multiple backend proxies that I'm using. If, I'm, if I have Burp and Zap up together, because they do work a little differently, I can easily route my traffic. Um, and then there's other things to allow me to easy see JSON or other stuff. <clears throat> I, I have one question. Um, get, given that uh, a tremendous amount of... Um, Things on the uh, web are moving mobile and moving to um, JSON RESTful APIs. Uh, do you do you feel like this, the tool sets are sophisticated enough for us from a pen testing perspective to to handle that situation? So I'll start off with that. I haven't done too much mobile testing. I have done a little bit. I find where the the issue is is I mean if if you have um, 
uh, web calls that some mobile application is doing. There are ways that with Burp and Zap or other tools like Fiddler and such, you can still intercept that. You can set up those to listen on a, on a common network port and then just route your traffic to that. Um, the challenge is more at the network level with some sites doing certificate pinning, some sites um, not using and abiding by the system level proxy settings for the, the device um, and just go making a direct socket out to a, um, a site. So we have to get a little bit more crafty when, um, when we're trying to do mobile testing if the web applications are not designed to use like the system level proxy. But if it is designed to use the, the system proxy, we can send that right to Burp or Zap and treat it just like any other web application. Um, I got another question about Burp and Zap. You've mentioned both of them. There's a lot of people that don't know quite where the delineation is between the two because they're very, very similar. In what situations would you recommend Burp? If what, recommend, what situations would you recommend Zap? And roughly how functional would you say Zap is compared to Burp? An excellent question, John. And up until recently, I would have said, you know, my, my first choice is always go to Burp. Um, but there have been some changes recently. Um, Burp Suite Pro is usually what we talk about. If we're in the pen testing world um, and we do web pen tests, usually we'll spend the $300 or so to get Burp Pro. It's fully featured. It has a lot of nice, nice things there. Burp Free... Um, has several features that web pen testers use all the time that are a little bit throttled or disabled. Um, and some of those features, uh, if you need to do it and you don't have the funds to go get Burt Pro, um, that's where Zap comes into play. For instance, Burt Pro has a wonderful fuzzer. It's called Intruder. And there's so many different flexible amounts of, uh, so many, it's very flexible when dealing with payloads and payload creation and just sending thousands of requests to a web server. Um, and it's great. In the free version of it, uh, that's throttled. So the more requests you send, the slower it gets. And that's just not going to play. In the new version of Zap, version 2.4 and above, um, they've actually done a really good job of, of mimicking the functionality <coughs> of Burr Pro for free. So um, if you can't afford Burr Pro, I say try out Zap. Um, and see what that gets you and see if you, you like that. It is a little different interface, though, and some people just prefer Burp, Burp Free or Burp Pro to the Zap. Micah, you've been giving a talk recently at some conferences called Running Away from Security, Web App Vulnerabilities in OS in Collide. What is, what is that about? Uh, so actually, it, it's a kind of a fun thing I've been getting into lately. It's, it's uh, open source intelligence gathering. It's Taking somebody's name and, and maybe a phone number or something. Bless you. <coughs> Thank you. You going to be okay? Yeah, I think I'm okay. <coughs> um, Sorry, allergies. No, no problem. So you know, I have, I have, I have I Elvis there for a second. Uh, <laughs> do you feel that we are reaching that point that many sysadmins already felt where a pen tester cannot be a jack of all trades and we're moving further and further uh, along the rabbit hole where people actually have to be specialized, uh, where we're going to have specialized pen, pen testers in web applications and not only in all web applications, but in special subsets of those. So I think if you've been doing penetration testing for a while, you'll recognize that there's several areas within pen testing that, that more senior people gravitate towards, whether it's web app testing or Wi-Fi or system or network penetration or mobile. Um, people gravitate towards different areas. And then within those areas, there's sub-disciplines. Um, I think there's always going to be a need and desire for that, that uh, jack-of-all-trades pen tester. Um, but there's also those people that can go deeper and discover more or just, you know, they can see the matrix when they're doing web app hacking. And, and um, so I, I think the world needs both people because if you have somebody that, that can do web app hacking and they get some SQL injection there and they only know web app hacking and they get to compromise, you know, they, they are, they're able to do things on the underlying operating system you want somebody in general that that's comfortable exploiting Windows or Linux or whatever the underlying operating system is, and and sometimes web app pen testers that just do web apps they focus on the application layer but don't really penetrate with their knowledge um, down to the operating system level. So I think the world needs both, and um, and it's fine to have them. Now, the the way I see it is that right now we have. Uh 
many pen test companies out there just simply go and just put one single pen tester on a very large engagement. And uh, many customers do not know that they may have different requirements. And um, when, the pen t- uh, when the pen test company or the security company comes to you and says, we're going to be putting two pen testers to work on this engagement or three different pen testers, we kind of need to kind of get the word out and educate some of our customers like, hey, you have a very large surface here. You have a lot of different uh, services. It, you will be better served if we're actually providing you specialists for the different phases of this pen test where they can work together to actually provide the best value to you. I find that many times, um, just like with any other consultant services, people just look at the price and don't look what they're actually getting. Absolutely, and and that's where being a good customer comes into play, an educated customer. Um, if you if you're sick, you can go to a general practitioner who can can diagnose you to a certain level. But if you're really sick or you you need a specialist, um, that's where you go to a specialist. And so, same thing in in pen testing. I absolutely agree with what you're saying. Is is if you have a large web application presence, and and that's really what you're expecting somebody to test. You want somebody that knows web apps or whatever the technology is um, so that you can get the most for your money. There's a joke in there about a proctologist, but... There is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not quite coming together for me. <laughs> so uh, talk about web apps in OS in. Yeah, so, so one <clears throat> of the things that I did, you know, as a pen tester, uh, there's, uh, I bet you all have done this too, you know. You can't shut it off sometimes. You're just somewhere and you see... Uh, whether it's an ATM with one of those Windows uh, crash uh, core dump screens, blue screens of death, or or, or something, you see something, you're like, I, you know what? I, I bet that's exploitable. I bet that's bad. Um, one day, one of my friends and I went out for a bike ride, and is your and friend's name Bob? I know Bob. Yes, yeah. <laughs> there's a little Bob in all of us. There's a little Bob. In all. <laughs> um, my friend, we went out for a ride on a bike, and then uh, afterwards, she sent me a link to Strava which is a website for exercise tracking. And uh, it had a little GPS route of where we went, and it was really cool. But when I moused over the link, I noticed it was just an integer. It was like Strava slash activities, strava.com slash activities. It just had a number there, and I was like, wait a second. Uh, let me look at this. So I, I just, you know, decremented that number, and I got somebody else's route. <laughs> uh, no, and, no, I mean, no, that's no, that can't, can't do, happen right? anymore. Direct <laughs> object reference is dead. Even I know. Oh, oh my God. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, but, I mean, it, it's so easy. I did this, uh, well, a friend of mine did this. Bob. Uh, Bob. <laughs> we call him Bob. Bob. Yeah. So I know this guy named Bob who did this. He, he took his car into a dealership to get a recall fix, <laughs> and the guy at the dealership handed uh, Bob a, a slip of paper that said, hey, you can check on your status of your car online. I was like, the, I mean, Bob was like, that's really cool. And it was just a number. So Bob went online to the dealership, <laughs> typed in the five-digit number, and pulled up his car, his VIN, his name, his address, what things were being done, the prices of that, and so Bob decremented that number and incremented it and got other people's things. Um, so I started thinking, I mean, Bob started thinking about all of the different things that could be done with this and how easy it is to do these things. Um, and so th- that was one of the things that got, got me kind of started in uh, doing open source intelligence gathering. People are using services now on the Internet that tell you exactly where they are or where they run or where they walk or bike ride on a regular basis. And if I could pull up that data or somebody else could profile them, then that sets them up for uh, you know, being attacked as they run around a lake or somebody robbing their house. And in fact, back when I made this, this talk called Running Away from Security, I made this talk back in February. And I, I postulated you know, somebody could get attacked or, or theft and all. And then um, later on in the year, probably around May, June, there were actually... Uh, there was this episode of CSI Cyber. Yes. You oh, know, oh, no. Mr. Mr. Robot. Mr. Robot, much better Robot. reference, yes. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, there, <sighs> there were, there were uh, things in the news that said, hey, the, uh, you know, I will, I, people were looking at Strava.com, finding out where people were bicycling around, and then they would wait for them to come back and steal their bicycle or they would break into their car because they knew that every day at this time this person was at this location. Um, Mm -hmm. So I started tying that all together. What can we grab from the web? 
how can we put the little pieces of people's lives together um, to show a compelling picture of, of the insecurity that we now have? That's it, what it's about. Yeah, your, your, your friend Bob's story about the the car uh, system. Um, I actually hits home for you. Well, previously I was you used to live there. in in the car business. I actually had a, a very similar conversation. Unfortunately, it was with a bunch of dealership system administrators, and uh, a lot of them, as well as vendors in the room, didn't understand the value of it, and so. Uh, this time it wasn't me who started with the bad thing. And what they suggested was, well, if I have that information, I can call the customer at the end of the day and say, I'm sorry, sir, we screwed up your bill. <clears throat> and um, could you swing back into the uh, the dealership with your credit card? And we just we just need to correct the bill. And I said, no, you're you're not thinking well, because what I would do if I were a bad person, which I'm not, is I would use that information, call them up, and say, "I'm really sorry to bother you, sir or ma'am, but we made a mistake. Again? We made a mistake with yeah. your credit card, and we actually overcharged you. So I would like to refund you seventeen dollars and eighteen cents, or some small amount, but make it clear that it's to refund the money, and ask them to drive back in. And since you know they live eighty miles away, and it was a pain in the ass to get there, they're like, "Oh my God, I don't care for that much money." It's like, well. Normally, we don't do it over the phone because of security, but if you're comfortable giving me your credit card number over the phone, I'll process your credit right now. Also, yeah. they don't have a... And, be, also they and don't once have you a, build these scenarios... They don't have a car, though, at that point. Right. Well, no, no I mean, so because, <laughs> the, because that information never yeah. expires in right. a timely manner yeah. either. And so you tell these things, and, and, and I, I know the pain oh, of I trying see. to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the pain of trying to get back. these people... Yeah. To understand how you could abuse that, because you've got to come up with a story. But that one is is painfully close to past um, experiences of mine. And you find them, and you, you, you just slap your forehead, and then you try to get somebody else to understand <laughs> why it is you're up and down. Why, why are you jumping up and down and screaming? It's, it's <clears> only, <throat> like you said, it's only their name, your make, model, of vehicle that they drive, Address, phone number, email address, you know, VIN of the car, license plate number, repair history, uh, mm. <laughs> right, right? You know, it, um, so you can make some assumptions based on what kind of car they drive and what their address is. And mm -hmm. uh, it just, you, yeah, yeah. And if you don't tell a story, they just don't get why. Yep. This is, yeah. it's just a website. Well, and don't you find that, I mean, for, for you all have been in security for many years, too. Don't you find that our job is now more to convince people, to show them the goods and to make them care about things? I mean, you know, the, if you say, yeah, hey, absolutely. You're, you're, you're vulnerable to, to this vulnerability, they're like, meh, you got a patch. Meh, hey, I have all of your HR data because you didn't patch that. Now they care. Um, that's, that's really what I find myself doing a lot more is, is being the convincer. Right. And you don't want to be the fear monger, but you want to give them legitimate, you know, bad scenarios. And yeah. uh, if you can get them to think rationally, then then you let them uh, make an informed decision. Right. Then it, then well, it becomes a, the a risk. Is, then it becomes well, a But at first you have to get them to pay attention. Well, and I think people think that computers and the Internet are like this magical thing. Like they're only... Using their Shh. phone, Shh. like listen. Don't everything tell people after computers that. aren't magic. It's just magic, right? It's just magic. So when we try and explain these things, they're like, it dispels the magic. They're like, what do you mean bad things can happen? No, this that's is broken. great. I can go yeah. online and see the status of my car. Like that's magical, and you're spoiling my magic. Yeah, that's that's yeah. part of the problem. Breaking my. But why should why why should they have to understand? We're popping their balloon. I agree with you, Paul. But yes. Uh, you know, no, you're right. They, it, why should they have to understand? Well, I think it's part of the problem is that when you try and explain to them the dangers, if they don't understand some of the, like, it's not all magic. Danger zone. It's it's all about the danger zone, Joff. That's, it is. It is. And it, it is like there's a lot of hand-waving. Like like you said, it's like, oh, this is so magical. This is awesome. Um, and uh, at, at that point, the brain shuts off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um. Micah, I want to ask you five questions. 
Now you've listened. <laughs> you've listened to the show before. You said previously, so you, yeah. you probably got a pretty good idea what these five questions are. You might have even prepared for these five questions. Uh, nope. All right. I so haven't. You, you're oh. non non prepared <laughs> five questions. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay. Three words to describe yourself. Uh, active, uh, analytical, and bald. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? My mind. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Um, oh, God. Um, there you go. There's a title. That's a great title. Oh, oh God. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> oh, God oh. <laughs> In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Second. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Uh, Morgan Fairchild and John Lovitz. John Lovitz, I like that one. That's a good that's one. A, that's that's a good that one. is a good one. I like that. <laughs> Excellent. And, Michael, so where are you teaching next, and what is your website and Twitter handle? Sure. So I'll be at uh, teaching at the Hackfest um, in Alexandria, Virginia, in November. Um, Sans.org has the information on that. And my website is webbreacher.com, W-E-B, Breacher. Um, and then my Twitter handle is webbreacher. Excellent. Actually, now you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash SANS and land on the SANS website. Securityweekly.com forward slash SANS. Please do that. So thank okay. you very much, Micah, for being on the show. It was wonderful having you. I hope to see you at a SANS event uh, sometime soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, everybody. Excellent. With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and talk about the security news for this week. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. 